majority of the time they have an adjustable thermostat on there. You can go turn them up, hear them or watch them kick on, get an amp reading, everything's good. Uh, and set them back. A chill water system with the condenser water, the condenser water becomes our cooling water, our chill water side. And it will pass through that economizer coil on the back of the self-contained freezer protection and economizer control. Uh, this is a automation class. I will do my best to cover it from a automation perspective with a mechanical flare. That way we kind of get it from both directions. Um, I can't go as in, in depth as say like Eric could on the, uh, like the, the, the logic sequence side, but I can kind of somewhat get there. Anyway, we are talking about, let's start off with just freeze protection to begin with. Uh, so there's a couple of different types of freeze protection. Uh, we have things like um, heat trace is one version, okay? You also have BMS, could be automated control. So under this category, you could be doing things like a, a loop protection for like with a, with a pump. Uh, through the pumps. That just to keep things circulating? Mm-hmm, yeah, and we'll dive into that. You could also do something like a, uh, a free stat. Okay, and then uh, what's another BMS type? Those are gonna be the two probably main ones we deal with. Um, we also have things like uh, basin heaters. So a basin heater would be considered a type of freeze protection. So when we talk freeze protection, we're, we're talking about protecting a water coil or, yeah, okay. or water, a hydronic system to some degree, right? Um, yeah, refrigerated system's not gonna, not gonna deal with that. Um, so that's, that's what that term is gonna revolve around. That's where the heat trace comes in. So heat trace is pretty straightforward. You, you, it's just, it's, it's electric tape. Vast majority of the time, it's 120 volt. Uh, what, one thing is, is really critical with that is you do need a thermostat installed. So you want a, typically a single pole uh, and you want to have a staff that will close on fall, okay? So you have to be very specific with that. You know, so it's a hurdle we've jumped a couple of times is you know, most thermostats we think of, you know, it's, we, it's gonna close on rise. When in reality, you want it to close on fall. So that way, once you get a bus, so say a, a typical set point for a heat trace thermostat would be somewhere around like 40 degrees, maybe 35 in some cases. So between 35 and 40 would be a reasonable uh, set point. And once you get down below, say, that 35 mark, that heat trace is going to close and engage. And anything below 35, it's going to run that heat trace on that pipe. And the heat trace's job is just to keep the pipe above freezing. That's all it's got to do. It's not about keeping it warm or hot or anything of that nature. It's just above freezing. Um, so, and then obviously, once you get back above that, you know, 35 mark, it needs to open back up. And many times it can be as easy as using just a basic refrigeration thermostat. You know, something you'd see in a walk-in cooler in some cases. Uh, those, those are really easy, cheap, in, effective thermostats that work well for heat trace. But, um, well, obviously though, let me clarify there. An actual thermostat in a walk-in cooler is gonna be an close on rise, right? So just don't literally ask for that, please. Anyway, uh, but the point is that style of thermostat, right? You even see that on some older boilers. You know, they've, they've got that type, of, uh, that type of just old mechanical with a sensing bulb and a diaphragm. You know, it's just really simple. You don't need some expensive, fancy electronic one or anything of that nature. Now, what you do have to be careful of, and a big consideration, is the type of environment that heat trace is going in. So if that, if that controller, that thermostat, is going to be in an uh, outdoor environment, you know, it's got to be a NEMA 4, NEMA 2, NEMA 4, you remember? 
No. Yeah, four. I think it's NEMA four is a outdoor rated environment, meaning it has the ability to completely seal. The ones that I was just explaining are not NEMA 4 rated. They're not outdoor rated stats. So you'd have to get a different style entirely at that point. Um, and some of those same thermostats might even be what runs a basin heater. So uh, a lot of times on cooling towers, most of the time these are gonna be an outdoor rated thermostat. And, and we'll, we'll hit on basin heaters. The basin heater's job is exactly what it sounds like. It's in the cooling tower. Its function is to keep the cooling tower basin from freezing. That's it. And it, it's gonna have the same parameters. You know, it's, uh, you know, engage at 35. It's gonna be a, a close on fall thermostat. Simple as that. Single pole, single throw, it's all you need. Um, pretty basic. Make sense? Okay. Now, where this gets really fun is the building automation system. We've got a, two primary types of uh, freeze protection that we go into. Uh, you have what's act, an actual freeze stat. So I think it's probably the simpler of them. With a freeze stat, it, it actually it kind of depends. There, there's a couple of flavors of how that could be set up. It could do either a... Um, Either it shuts off all outside air completely. So once that, so actually I don't know how to draw it. So typically a free stat and say a air handler. Okay, so you got a chill water air handler. Here's your air handler. You have a coil here, water inlet, water outlet. Right here on the entering side of that coil, there's going to be a little uh, you know, thermostat looking device and it's going to have a sensing tube, but it's not going to, it'll be a real long one typically. I forget the exact term that they have for that, uh, but the, there is an actual term for those. It's, it's just a long, thin wire or a tube almost. It doesn't even have a bulb on the end. Um, and its job is looking into this coil, it's going to uh, zigzag. Uh, back and forth across the surface of that coil, or it may only have one or two runs depending on how big of this, the space it has to cover, right? Its function is to read the air coming into this air handler so that as it's pulling in air, if it gets down below a, a freezing state, so if that air gets below 35 degrees, for example, uh, it will, one, it can shut down outside air a lot of the time. And then also uh, it may, it might even go as far as opening the valves for flow. So that way you can, um, you can have flow through that coil to prevent the potential of freezing in that coil with, with just stagnant water. All right, so it, there's, there's, those are the two ways that I can think of that that can be you know, controlled at times. For sure, you're gonna cut off that outside air. Now, one thing you have to think about is if you had a setup where this was to open, obviously this would be an air handler that's a cooling only. You couldn't have a heating air handler um, you know, then turn around and try to mix with the chill water coil and that's just going to fight each other. So that would be a very specific application. The main job there is just to stop that freezing air from entering the coil, which at this point is going to be the outside air. Or um, in some cases, it actually may just kill the fan entirely. So it will stop all fan operation so that it just, it can't continue moving that cold air. Um, so yeah, it just, it kinda, I'm not even sure which is the most prevalent from memory of which one they do the most of those flavors or what combination, but uh, they, they, any of the above. Um, when it comes to how we're getting that freezing area, and that'll go deeper into the economizer conversation, which we'll, we'll go into. But 
typically these free stats will be a manual reset. Uh, they'll have an actual button on them when they trip. You gotta, you gotta go push that button. So if you walk up and the air handler won't turn on, well, the two most common safeties that will cause that is uh, the high static limit tripped or the free stat tripped, which that could happen if the, uh, say this little sensing uh, tube that runs on the entering side of that coil, if that uh, gas pressure that's in there, if it drops too low or if it loses pressure, so say it gets a little pinhole leak or something, that could allow the gas to escape and it's gonna, uh, could simulate a low temperature condition at that point, which it, uh, that would be a failed SAT. You would, that would be pretty obvious. You'd try to go reset it and it, it probably wouldn't reset. It just, it's gonna sit there and immediately trip back out. You're gonna have to replace it and rerun that whole tube. But that's all one assembly. It's not, it's not something you're gonna like take this tube off and change it out and keep the same sensor. No, it's all packaged together. Got one in the truck, they wanna see it. Yeah. Sure, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like I said, it, it's it's it'll look like a refrigeration thermostat, right? So our boiler thermostat for high low fire on the on the older yeah. boiler. So picture that, except it'll be in the return side of the coil, and uh, or the or the air handler, the return side of the air handler, and it's going to be on like a chill water air handler. The, especially one that has outside air. Cool. Yeah, sweet. Let's get a show and tell going. Show and tell. There you go. So that's an adjustable. Hmm. Yeah, bring it up and you show. So you just you'd see this mounted on the outside of the cabinet, and you know this would poke through, like I said, just a regular diaphragm type. Uh, this one looks more like a pressure switch you'd find in a condensing unit or something. But you know, there's no sensing bulb. This whole line is the sensor. And so where, where typically you have a bulb on the end, that's your primary point of reading, well, no, this, this, is, this job is to get a median temp all the way across. So it just, it's more accurate that way. That way you can't have pockets, which can happen, you know, in the dead center where the air, air stream is the highest volume, you know, yeah, that might be, that might, might be colder than on the edges. So if you only have a little bulb sticking out on the edge, it may not see that freezing air in the middle. You, on a loop, so say we have freeze protection built into a, a loop uh, system. So we're talking you know, condenser water loop, we're talking chill water loop, either or. Uh, or even maybe, maybe a hot water loop at that. You know, any kind of hydronic loop. Once, uh, the automation at this point is going to be monitoring outside air temperature. You know, in, in modern days time, that's going to mean a, uh, an, a, you know, just an outside air sensor, you know, on the, on the building, checking that. Once it gets down below a certain threshold, it's going to go into a freeze protection mode, right? So again, that may be 35 degrees, maybe 40 degrees. Uh, once you enter that mode, uh, typically all the pumps are going to turn on. So we're specifically, so if this was a, uh, if this was an, a, say a, a closed loop tower, that's the most prevalent places you're gonna see this type of setup. If you got a closed loop tower, it's gonna turn on the building circulation pump, but it won't turn on the, circ the uh, sprayer pump on a closed loop. That's where the basin heater's job comes in, right? So the, but the, the building loop pump is going to flow, and, and the whole point of the flow is so that we can't have stagnant water that's allowed to freeze. And you would be surprised how much, uh, 
how much heat gets generated in a loop just from friction. Uh, we do have buildings that if, say, the, 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 when the chillers go down, if the pumps are not turned off within an hour of that chiller going down, that water will go from, you know, 50s up into over 100 degrees. And the building's not even that hot. You know, the building may be 80-something degrees, and the loop is 100-something degrees. And it's strictly because the water flowing through that pipe has enough friction in it that is generating that much heat in the loop. So that's just, that's what f the flow itself can do just because it can flow, right? Uh, but that's the goal. The goal is to turn that on. If there's any isolation valves, all those isolation valves need to open. If there's valve in the, valves in the units, or maybe there's a bypass valve somewhere, just getting that water to where it can properly flow to anywhere that it has the potential to freeze. So, and that's, that's the ultimate goal for that uh, freeze, for the, the automation to kick into a freeze protection mode. So, uh, Yeah, no, and that's, and yeah, if the building loses power, that's, that's exactly what happened to us in February. Yeah. I mean, and, and we had buildings. Huh? Yeah, no, we, I mean, we had buildings. I mean, sure, they had generators, but they didn't turn on. You know, that's what got a lot of people in trouble, is uh, he, they, they, they realized they didn't pay enough attention to their generators. Yeah, if it's building goes, now they got generators. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. just about every building you go to, they're there. Yeah. But now is the time to be a generator tech in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. So, uh, but that's, that's the reality we face, you know. Because at the end of the day, they did, all they had to do was just get that, get that pump online. And even if the basin freezes, typically, so what? You know, if you got a closed loop system and the basin freezes, it's not that big a deal. It's just going to stack ice in the basin. Um, well, I say that where it will become a big deal is this: the sprayer pump housing will could freeze, but that's that's a lot less significant than say the actual heat exchanger bundle freezing and busting, and you know, they going from there. Uh, and, and you wouldn't want the circulation pump to turn on either because if that pump is allowed to run and it's flowing water over the heat exchanger, you're only continuing to, you're, 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 you're contributing to the, the, uh, the, the heat loss which is going to lead to the freezing, right? So that's, that pump cannot turn on during that state. So you are dependent on that basin heater to be functioning. And that is why, like on PMs, it is really important, especially this time of year, to be meticulous with basin heaters. And majority of the time, they have an adjustable thermostat on there. You can go turn them up, hear them, or watch them kick on, get an amp reading, everything's good, and then set them back. What would be a normal set range for that thermostat? 35 to 40 would be my suggestion. That's what majority of them run at. So... Um, anyway, yeah, we get below a certain temp, kick into freeze protection mode, pumps turn on, valves open up, we're flowing water, you know, as best we can, and hope that something doesn't freeze. Now, again, we don't use glycol, so keep that in mind. And, and we've actually, I've, as a, that's a conversation that has come up with customers. Uh, throughout this year was, well, we should start using a glycol in, in system. Our systems here aren't designed for that. So when you start adding glycol to a loop, uh, one, you have to get the concentration high enough, and then two, you start losing efficiency because glycol doesn't transfer heat like pure water does. So when you start diluting that, sure, you're going to save yourself in... Uh, uh, and, and, you're, and you're freezing, but 
typically it's it's going to one it's really expensive to do especially if you've got a full building loop like that's a lot of glycol it's not cheap and the second of all you're going to lose a lot in efficiency so you're going to spend a lot more in electricity trying to maintain the building because you know the the cooling tower is not going to keep up as well the chiller is not going to perform as well you know the water source heat pumps or the self-contained systems whatever it is i mean you're you're going to reduce your capacity and efficiency and if you go too heavy with the glycol solution you know you may go so far as to the building may not even be able to keep up anymore because it was already designed or running at you know close to its limit before the glycol was there you add the glycol you take some capacity away from it now it definitely won't keep up in the middle of summer and that's just the difference between us and more northern states you know there there's uh there's there's loops you know further north that they've got a really high glycol concentrations now i couldn't tell you what what that really means i just know that it's it, it's a lot it's very significant. So, with, so pretty much all their systems would be oversized from what we would see here. Mm -hmm. so right. Less demand for cooling, so that's yeah. Yeah. But like you said, you know, yeah, they, they that's engineered into the specs. So they, they purposed it for that. And, you know, of course, at the same time, many of their systems, so they have, once they break over into their freezing season, they're in freezing. And up into that, kind of like we do here, you know, we kind of fluctuate back and forth a little bit. Well, so do they. They have, that's why the glycol's there, so that during that fluctuation time, until they just go dead winter, uh, it, that, that'll protect them. And most of those types of buildings, my understanding at least, not having actually been there to experience it, is they, they, do, they drain their loops. Rarely... Do, they, do loops or towers or anything get left with water in them through the dead of winter, is, is my understanding, I, I, you know, unless it's like a f facility. The only time you see glycol here is if it's a industrial type environment where they're having to run process chillers or coolers or anything of that nature. Um, so that's, that's, that's literally the only time we ever run into glycol in our, in our environment. And even then, they run really low concentrations. You're talking like 10, 15 percent, you know, just enough to, because there's, there's one facility, they, had, they ran their chill water at just above, like in, in the upper to mid 30s, because it was, it was running, it was running some specific type of equipment or something for its cooling. I forget the exact scenario. It's been a while since I've worked on it. Hmm? But, but that, that's, that was their primary reason as to why they had glycol in it was because they, they ran it so cold. So they had to have the glycol there so it would run at a lower freezing point in the water and da 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 So anyway, uh, that conversation has been part of it. And that's where that conversation goes is one, can your system even handle it? And two, are you prepared to spend the extra money? And some of these buildings that are like Energy Star certified and stuff, that's a real quick way to lose that type of certification because you're going to lose that efficiency. Just, you are. You know, we're, we're not built for that. Um, any questions on freeze protection? You could also bring in a boiler somewhere, and I've seen that involved in freeze protection. When you're talking about bringing on your Mm -hmm. I've seen the boiler involved in freeze protection as well. Like in the case of, uh, like, yeah, certain buildings. So once it got, once, if the building went into a freeze protection state, it would enable the boilers automatically. Yes. To a certain, yeah. Wouldn't it come on regardless? Yeah. Sorry, I've got a picture of what you're saying here. Yeah, I'm... Yeah, I've seen freeze protection on uh, boilers, so I don't know exactly how that plays in the situation. I mean, it's a 
By the time you get to that point, it's a pretty good time to have your boilers on anyway. Well, I guess you know, I guess you know, <laughs> Here, <move>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah. Yeah. They would have already been on. I know of a building, we don't service it, but I know of a building that has a small heater coil in front of their outdoor air unit that it runs a minute amount of hot water through it just to heat the coil. So the coil that's freezing the air comes across the hot water coil first, mm -hmm. heats up the air just enough where it doesn't hit that chilled water coil. Yeah, and that's, that's pretty common. You know, a lot of buildings, uh, if it, it, whether it's hot water or even just electric heat, it will have a heater uh, it installed where the VAV is, this controlling outside air into that air handler in the mechanical room. So that once it drops below a certain temperature, then yeah, it's, it's, it'll get that temperature up. So that's, that's pretty common to see. Now, not very many people have us do maintenance on their outside air heaters. So that's a thing, but... Uh, yeah, they're definitely there, you know, if, if you look. It's, it's actually, it's not very common to not have them. So, anyway. Okay, let's go into economizers. Yeah, well, so. Huh? Oh, so we've got two. We've got two directions we can go with this. So we can stick with the automation route and talk a little bit about how automation system will use the economizers. And you have two types of economizing modes. You have you know an air economizer and you have a water economizer, depending on what type of system you have. The water economizers are not very common in our area. I only know of three. I only know of three. I'm sure there's probably more than that out there, but I, I can I know of three buildings that use it. Uh, can you explain how that yeah, we will. So let's let's start with an air, just a basic air economizer. Okay, so we're talking a uh, a chill water air handler, you know, or even it doesn't even have to be necessarily that. It could be a chill water, it could be a DX air handler that runs a floor. Okay, well, you walk into mechanical room and there will be a outside air um, intake going into that room. So part of what will happen is just like a, say, an RTU economizer would function, you'd have a similar logic built into the, um, uh, the, 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 the air handler controller to where once the outside air temperature dropped below a certain point and the humidity, you know, which they kind of go hand in hand, but once we got down below a certain set of parameters, we're going to stop the mechanical cooling. So let's say we're running chillers on the building. We can turn our chiller plant off because we're below 55 degrees outside and we can open up our, um, uh, our outside air to 100% and you would enter what's you know, a free cooling state. And so you like, most automation systems have modes, and, and sometimes the mode is local to the air handler, sometimes it could be the whole building, just really depends, but it'll, it'll have a mode uh, just like a, a regular thermostat would, you know, where it goes into cooling mode, or it goes into heating, or you have free cooling, or you have freeze protection, you know, there's different, you know, modes that it can kick into and it'll go in uh, and take off. So, in that particular case, the building has to be designed to have a free cooling option. So if you've got a building that's got just a, you know, 12 by 12 outside air dropped into the mechanical room, you're not going to get legitimate free cooling out of that tiny little outside air drop. Okay? When you start seeing systems like this that are actually designed to run a true free cooling system, it'll have a trunk coming off of the return that's basically the same size as the trunk that runs to the floor. And it will pull 100% out 
outside air and, and dump into that space to provide cooling. And it can turn off all the mechanical cooling. And you're talking tremendous energy savings at that point. Now the trouble is we have very limited days that that's actually even a feature we can use. Because it's, you're basically talking probably like 55 to maybe 40, 45 in most cases. It, for, for us, like we've got, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks worth of that kind of weather. Yeah, basically. So, you know, we, we either, we're either above that or... That's not the second quarter. No, no, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we're either above that or we fly right past it. So, but still, the option is there. And at that point, you know, instead of spending hundreds of kilowatts an hour on a chiller plant to stay online, you turn all that off and you spend just a few kilowatts an hour to run a, a blower motor on a VFD and you can maintain all the same cooling. At that point, you've got a really light cooling load anyway. So if you had a light cooling load, would you say, would you still economize with less or and try to use, I guess, the, the like a refrigerated coil or something to make a difference or would you just only go into economize in those specific wet bulb, dry bulb sort of scenarios? So it's, it's, it's going to go, uh, it, once it gets below that outside air temp, it's going to go into economize. Now, depending on the type of air handler, whether it has heat built into the air handler or whether it does terminal heat down in the space, either way, most of the systems we have today have terminal heat in the space at this point. And so that air handler is just going to continue to run in, in cooling and it's going to provide that cold air throughout the, the, the duct trunk, the trunk system to the terminal units. And it's, the terminal units will then decide how much of that air it's going to allow through and, you know, if it needs to heat or not. Answer your question? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. That's an aerosol economizer for a typical commercial building, right? With with a say, say a hydronic setup. Um, now we go into a water side economizer. Oh, let me see if I can draw this. So you'll have a cooling tower. And say we've got a, um, we've got a chiller, okay? Got our condenser and our evaporator. All right. Here off to the side, there is going to be a heat exchanger, EX. So typically, you know, your normal setup is you're going to have a set of pipes running straight here. You'll, you know, you'll have your pump here in the middle doing its thing. Um, then you, you're flowing. You're flowing through through the chiller to the cooling tower, back and forth, yada yada, and your chill water goes to all the building air handlers to, to cool it. Right? That's a typical cooling cycle. Right? Well, whenever you have a water a water economizer, what we'll do is we'll use a plated heat exchanger, uh, typically. And there will be a set of bypass valves. So what we'll do is we'll take this condenser water and we will stop flow and we will run this condenser water over to this heat exchanger. And then, here I'm gonna do this a little different. To the heat exchanger and then back out 
to the tower, and then we will have another bypass on the chill water side. I saw this on a building automation screen once, and I had no idea what was happening here, and this is all making sense now. So what will happen is the flow to the chiller stops. Okay, so we've got a valve. When we go into economizer mode, like so you're talking about a central plant at this point. When you go into economizer mode, you're stopping flow through the chiller. And what hap this cooling tower actually becomes your cooler, like your, your, your cooling loop for the building. So this, the cooling tower, so we're, we're with the chiller, we were trying to maintain, let's say, a 75 degree condenser water for the, 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 the centrifugal chiller. Well, we kick over into economizer mode. This set point is gonna drop to like 45 degrees or 40 degrees, okay? And uh, its job at that point is to, to cool that water down and it's, it's gonna chill the condenser water to the point to where it can maintain the chill water loop. And so, these waters aren't mixing through the heat exchanger, okay? This, it's plated, and so there's different chambers in that heat exchanger that it will flow the water through. And as it does, you know, obviously the warmer, chill water that's cooling the building will transfer to the condenser water, and then it would reject straight through the cooling tower. Now, the number one... The, the, the two critical things at this point that you're really paying attention to is outside air temp makes a difference and your wet bulb also makes a difference. So we have to get our outside air and our wet bulb low enough, specifically the wet bulb. The wet bulb is the most critical part in this type of setup because your wet bulb is going to dictate how much that cooling tower can cool the water down. So our goal is to get that, to, to wait till our wet bulb temperature drops into say the 40s, and then we can actually get our condenser water down that low. Before I move on, does, does that make sense? Okay. Uh, I think that's why hospital cooling towers is always just going crazy in the winter. I would assume so. Well, they also have like MRI machines that the yeah. process cooling thing. I've always wondered that because it's always a hospital that's got a cooling tower just going mad. Well, yeah, we did, they got process cooling going here. Because you like the MRI machines, you have to keep those things cold. That's you have to keep those magnets warm. It was a thought. I, I hadn't really mm -hmm. considered that. And then I was just like, man, maybe that's why. But, but it's definitely like why it's like cold outside in the morning. If it's 40, 50 degrees outside, you definitely see all these cooling towers just full bore. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. So, it, it, and yes, hospital going crazy in the winter, more than likely they, they've got a water side economizer. Maybe just I say hospital because that's the most visible sort of. Right. But yeah, no, and you're talking a industrial type environment at that point. So on the industrial side, I think it's where you, you're probably going to see this the most. When it comes to heavy commercial real estate, things of that nature, it's there. It's just not very prevalent. It's expensive to put in. I mean, you're talking extra piping, extra automation control, extra components. You know, this heat exchanger ain't cheap. Uh, you know, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of extra expense that goes into putting this system in. And most of your commercial buildings, just they're not gonna spend it. So anyway, uh, where this becomes tricky and what you have to be careful of when you set a system up like, like, like this is there's got to be delays built in because what can happen is if the control logic is not sequenced properly, you're, it, it, yeah, you can cycle back and forth between mechanical cooling and economizer mode too rapidly and you cannot feed you know, 40, 50 degree water to that chiller condenser. That chiller is not gonna appreciate you very much and it's gonna turn into a service call. But it's gonna start tripping out, having surging issues, all kinds of stuff. So 
those are things you have to take and you have to keep in mind. Um, now, like I said, that is the detriment of this type of system is until, in some cases, in some of our buildings, the only way we have to get that water temp back up is the chiller. So the chiller takes the brunt of that, but... So in the case of, uh, sorry, in the case of uh, switching it back to process a mechanical cooling, do they have to wait, like make the building cool to warm the cooling tower back up or something like that? Like that's what you're talking about the lake. So would you just yeah, so I guess would, would you just shut the cooling tower off and just let the pumps roll until it heats up enough? Yes, if you have a um, if you have a closed loop, it'll work a lot better. But you're saying that sometimes that's not even it just it's, yeah, it's not enough. Uh, there are scenarios where it was just designed that way, and the the, the chiller is what takes it. Yeah, it's not it, it, not for long. So, and like I said, if depending on the type of chiller you have, it's going to depend on how it's going to react. Uh, there are some chillers that you know they they will for a very short time. They'll take that and they'll just they'll kind of deal with it and roll on. And there are a lot of chillers that won't. Uh, it's just it's just not going to do that. So are there parameters set differently in those kind of units? The ones that can handle it, or they set a little lower or higher versus those that can't handle it? Not really. So it's just built-in tolerance. Yeah, B because what there's a term for this that we, we actually use is called inversion. So you have an inverted loop. So an inverted loop is when your chill water gets higher than your condenser water. And that creates a low ambient situation just like you would deal with on a, on a DX split system. But it's a lot more dramatic with a chiller. So it, like I said, it really depends on the style of machine, for example, um, train CVH series compressors, they're, they're, they're going to take it fairly well. They're going to take it better than most. Uh, those are pretty robust compressors and uh, you'll probably have some surging, but it should recover from it without a whole lot of trouble. And then some chillers like a, a Daikin WMC series with a turbo course, they're, they are designed to recover from uh, inversion. So they, they will run through a control sequence and, and pull themselves back out of it. It's, it's hard on the compressors. It's not good to do that because to do that, you're constantly overheating the compressor. But they will do it. Uh, some of your other, like York and Carrier, high-speed centrifugals, uh, they're going to be a lot more reactive. Now, the York, lesser than, because they, they actually have it to where they'll run, they can tolerate some pretty cold condenser water. So until you get that condenser water back, that's what's, that's what's going to hurt you, is trying to get that condenser water back up. Uh, carrier, on the other hand, you, you're going to really feel it the most. So it just... It just, it really depends on the machine you have and the plant setup you have. It just, there, there's no, I can't give you a set standard for that. How, how about that? It really, really d depends on the design and the equipment. But that is what that is. So, um, not something we deal with a whole lot, but it exists. So there's no easy way to work that water up? <laughs> to, um, I mean, not really, unless you had some specific way of, of generating heat in there. Uh, in, in some cases, you may be able to let the chill water loop warm up enough to where it can try to get some heat back into that condenser water prior to transferring over, you know, something along those lines. Most of the loops that I see, the, uh, they just have the chiller take the brunt, honestly. 
uh, whenever they cycle between economizer mode and mechanical mode, uh, they just they, they slap the chiller a few times and force it to, to do the work. So, at the end of the day, I mean, when you start doing stuff like that, you're going to cause failures. You know, you know when, anytime you put yourself in a surging, a surge type condition, uh, you're, you're going to deal with having to do more overhauls, having to do a lot more heavy maintenance. You know, there's going to be those types of repercussions. So, now, on the other hand, a chiller like an RTHD that's got a screw compressor on it, it's water cooled, it's going to laugh at it. Like, it won't like it, but it's not going to have that big of an impact. What it will hurt is the oil. You'll get a lot of oil migration. Anyway, moving on. Uh, we've covered that. Okay. Now, moving on to the regular DX economizer modes. Um, most of our RTUs have some form of, you know, economizer control board, and it will be a separate module from the main RTU controls. You know, it's it's it, even if. It, some of the newer ones, you start, I've started to see them actually be installed in the, the main control panel, but the vast majority out there, there's going to be some kind of economizer module at the economizer assembly itself. So now what classifies an economizer versus just an outside air intake is that it actually has modulated outside air. There are dampers in there that control and run and do their thing and run off of sensors to, to control that. So uh, just because it's got some hoods on the outside of the unit, it, it may not actually have economizer control. It may just be hoods for some outside air intakes, and that's it. And they're, they're just set to a, a fixed position, and that's as far as they go. Uh, it is something to definitely check. Uh, economize, checking the economizer should be a part of like a maintenance inspection or, or anything of that nature. Uh, if you walk up to a unit and you're wanting to check cooling and the cooling won't turn on but you have say call it Y1 and Y2 from the thermostat but yet this, the compressors don't engage, the first place you should go is that economizer control board. Because what happens is it comes up from the thermostat to the unit terminal board, you know, R, G, Y, and then from there it passes through the economizer control, then it goes back to the main MCB, main control board for the unit. So if <clears throat> If you go to call for cooling and it's, say, 53 degrees outside, that economizer control board is going to see that Y signal and go, okay, well, I'm cold enough. I'm not going to allow this Y to pass through. It's going to keep that open on the, main, on the MCB, and it's just going to open the outside air damper to 100% to allow free cooling. And... Uh, it's just something to be aware of. That also just fails. You know, you walk up to a unit in the summertime and it, you see that economizer is there and you still can't get the cooling to turn on, but yet you don't have a low pressure and you don't have any obvious safeties you think are tripped. You, you need to go to that economizer board because whether it's during the summer or during the winter, that signal passes through there. And when it fails, it will keep out your, your circuit. Uh, we had a scenario Actually, this summer, uh, there was a unit that the, um, the outside air sensor had failed. And it was, it was a, a, a new install, hadn't been in, but maybe a, a, a few months. And all of a sudden, all the mechanical cooling quit. It wouldn't work. It was pulling outside air. You know, it was, it was, it was acting up big time. And we'll go out there. 
And after tracing through it, I realized, you know, you, you look inside and it has the, um, has the old black, uh, was it Honeywell uh, control modules in there. And there's a little free cooling light was lit up. It was 100 degrees outside, but yet it was in free cooling mode. And it was because the outside air sensor had failed and it thought it was colder than it was. So it wouldn't allow that circuit to turn on. Now, in that particular case, I was able, you, you can just bypass uh, through a set of jumpers, the economizer control assembly, and that will let all that go back to the MCB and it'll take off and do its thing until you can get that economizer repaired. But those actuators on the economizers are really common failure points. The sensors are really common failure points. Uh, I see less of the actual controllers themselves. Typically the controllers are pretty robust. It's, it's the actuators and the sensors that get most people in trouble. So, uh, things to look for. Now, when you start talking on a bigger scale, so let's say we're, we're now going into um, IntelliPak type systems, you know, where we actually have uh, legitimate building air control. You know, now you're talking about systems that are paying attention to things like CO2 levels. Uh, it's going to use that economizer assembly. It's not really necessarily an economizer conversation, but it all ties together, you know, to maintain that CO2 level in the building. So not all of them do it. Uh, many of them will have a separate system that monitors outside air for CO2 and, and uh, but there are some out there that it will go through the RTU. So those are scenarios where you walk up to a unit and you see that's happening, just be aware. Uh, we also have a lot of new buildings going in that the RTU is the outside air control. It's the RTU, it's, it's doing the mechanical cooling, but it's also processing all of the outside air in one. Those Daikin, um, what do they call them, the Daikin packs. I believe, or something like that. Uh, those are prime examples of where they do both in one. They, they're mechanical cooling and outside air control. They have exhaust uh, fans and they have outside air intakes. Um, where those get extra tricky is you start talking about trying to maintain uh, a building pressure. And that's what's actually controlling how much of those, how, how much those exhaust fans or relief fans in, in some cases uh, run, how fast, yada, yada. So just another, it's another variable of where you're looking at this economizer assembly and it, it's open when it shouldn't be or it's, it's uh, not open enough. You know, those are types of variables that you're going to start running into uh, as, as time goes on. You know, there's a lot of new buildings. They're not having dedicated outside air units like they used to. You know, they're, they're being all built into one. Any questions on that? Okay. Have you ever seen the self-contained with the uh, economizer, like the uh, water coil on it? Because allegedly the SWPs or SW, yeah SWPs, mm -hmm. they have a, a like you're talking about what the chiller goes in the bypass and all that. Well, you can do the same thing with a cooling tower that cools a coil. Mm -hmm. Have you actually ever seen one of those? Yes, and we have buildings that have them. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. So I'm actually I'm glad you brought it up. I didn't even think about those. So the the question was. For buildings that have, say it's a self-contained building, uh, and it's and more than just SWPs. So the SWP is specifically, you know, Dyke and McQuay series equipment. Uh, trains also are real common about doing it. But buildings that have that, that equipment going into a, an economizer mode, like a water side economizer using the cooling tower. Um, Typically, those will have a separate water coil, right? So on a typical self-contained, you'll have a, um, 
you'll have the, the regular evaporator coil, right? Pre that coil on the return side, on the inlet, inlet side of that, will actually be a separate coil. And it's not the evaporator that you're looking at. It is the economizer coil. And you'll look down at the bottom of the unit, and there'll be a set of valves. And so you'll have one set that kind of leads off to the back of the unit if you're looking at the control panel side. And you'll have another set that feeds the condenser assembly. So when that unit, when the, the, you're talking the whole building at this point is going to cycle into an economizer mode, <clears throat> that, those valves will cycle. So it'll stop flow through the refrigerant or mechanical cooling condensers, and it will pass its flow through that economizer section. And it will it just in the same type of sequence with the, the chiller loop, except instead of trying to chill a, uh, a chill water system with the condenser water, the condenser water becomes our cooling water, our chill water side. And it will pass through that economizer coil on the back of the self-contained and that is how we are getting free cooling or economized cooling out of it without running mechanical. I wonder if I've actually seen that just didn't recognize it. Probably. Yeah. And a lot of people, so either they start having problems with it, or they can't get the automation sequence tuned in right, and they have issues with that, or they just don't flat understand it. And I see it decommissioned all the time. There's a lot of buildings that, yeah, they can't, they have the function and built in for free cooling or economizer and it's completely unhooked, unwired, not even utilized. Self-contained is such great candidates for just disconnecting actuators. It, it goes back to it's understanding. Like <laughs> Every time. Yeah, it just, it, it goes back to people's understanding. People have, it's, there, genuinely, there's not very many of us that actually even service that side of the industry that ever see those. Just, there's really not. There's only a handful of companies that even work on self-contained type equipment that are even in those buildings. So at least in our area. Um, so yeah, people come in there, they've never seen that before, they don't know what it is, they can't in their mind, you know, they're trying to picture what the heck this thing is doing. Well, I'm having head pressure issues. Well, I see an actuator right here. Well, you know, why is this actuator pinched off? You know, I'm not having full flow. I can see it's just partially closed. Well, I mean, no wonder I'm having head pressure issues, right? What they don't understand is most of those systems, that valve, if it's modulating, self-contains have uh, head pressure control majority of the time but they're monitoring circuit one for that. Well, if circuit one is either tripped on safety or disabled or uh, say it's got a low charge. More specifically, that's the most common one. Circuit one's got low charge. And so it's running a lower head pressure and the head pressure is getting low. And, but yet we need circuit two and three to come on to help process the cooling load and circuit two and three keep tripping on high head pressure. But circuit one's doing perfectly fine, but you really look at it and it's on the edge of freezing up because it's so low on charge. Well, the problem is the low charge on circuit one has a transducer on the liquid line that's feeding back to the controls and it sees that, okay, I'm running a low head pressure. My condenser water must be getting cold I need to pinch off flow just like we would do on a water source heat pump so that I can maintain proper head pressure. Well, now you're, 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 you're getting a wrong reading on one and it's causing two, three, and four to now start tripping out because of one's low charge. So in people's minds, you know, it just, if, if either they did it temporarily until circuit one got fixed, or they didn't understand it to begin with, said, well, here's your freaking problem right here. The, the, the valve's closing off. It ain't supposed to do that. It's broke. You don't need it anyway. Just do away with it. It's wrong. No, it, it serves a purpose. It's supposed to be doing that. They're seeing a symptom and not understanding that 